to discuss this webinar, we bring together three leading juniors. Anthony Hall, Executive Director of, of American Pacific Forex, Vincent Alger, Managing Director of Australian and Canadian, and Andrew Stewart, CEO of Xanadu Mines. Anthony, Vincent, Andrew, welcome. Um, as an opening question to all three of you, has anything in your experience uh, prepared you for the communication challenges posed, or, or, and, and just the challenges in general posed by COVID-19? Perhaps I can go and turn to Vincent first, followed by Anthony, and then Andrew. Yeah, thanks very much, Andrew. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just again, my name is Vincent Elgar, Managing Director of AVL, Australian Vanadium Limited. Uh, we're currently developing a primary vanadium project in the Midwest region of Western Australia. So I have a dog fight outside my window. This is part of the environment we live in. Um, in answer to your question, Andrew, I think, uh, don't think I haven't seen anything like this in my life. I don't think many of us have. Um, it seems obvious it has some similarities to the GFC, but um, not this strong and extended personal and family threat that we see. And the rapid change that we've had to make uh, to our own lives and our businesses has been the biggest challenge um, from right from the beginning. Um, I think for us, it was about making rapid decisions early. Um, and for companies like ours that are developing projects, it's about uh, assessing the funding that is required to make those changes. So we came up with the best and most effective plan we could um, and acted quickly on staff and forward budgets to make that, make that take advantage. Communicating is obviously in this crisis is really difficult. And um, communication has many sides about communicating with the board, communicating with shareholders effectively, um, and then communicating with your team uh, and having effective lines in place in all of those areas, which we've tried to do. But, um, and I hope, we, hopefully we're doing a good job on that uh, for ourselves and our stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And yourself, uh, Anthony? Yeah, look, we're in a similar position to, to Vincent that we're looking to, we're in that sort of final stage of developing um, initial construction of a, a pretty exciting borate and um, potassium sulfate mine in California. So, you know, I don't think I've ever seen anything like this in my you know, 25 years of, of, of this experience. Um, you know, we acted really quickly as, as well. You know, we, we decided that it was better to act act quickly um, as opposed to, you know, to delaying the, the what we thought would probably be inevitable. Um, what that meant was, you know, changing a lot of contracts that we had, you know, changing the sort of the upfront, you know, uh, payments that would generally be associated with, you know, procuring, you know, initial equipment to, you know, to back-ending those types of arrangements. We, you know, put the travel bans in place quickly, um, you know, pulled all of the, all of, you know, a lot of expenditure out of the business on the basis that, you know, we're still not sure how long, you know, the, the markets are going to be sub subdued for. And I guess with, you know, share prices being, you know, smashed is probably the technical expression. You know, you don't want to be trying to raise money in this in, the, in this market. So, you know, in terms of communications, I, I'm not sure that we've sort of focused overly on communications. I think that there's a lot of other people that are doing the communicating for us. Um, you know, there's no shortage of news channels. There's no shortage of pages that are, you know, are communicating and there's no shortage of, you know, people understanding, you know, what's, what's going on. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, in this, in, you know, as you're developing, you know, you always come, you know, come, come a fundraise. Um, it's just the nature of, of, of the game until you start producing, you know, something. And on that basis, cash, cash is king. And we did a lot of, made a lot of very early, very quick initiatives to ensure that we preserved cash to the extent that we could, but continue to progress the project sensibly to make sure that, you know, we're in a position to, you know, build a build a mine as quickly as the you know the world becomes, I don't know, a new normal if you like. And yourself, uh, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Um, good to join you today, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, well, I guess these new webinars are the new way of communication. Um, but as an introduction, um, Sanadu Mines is a Australian and Canadian listed um, Mongolian focused copper and gold exploration company. Um, we've been exploring in Mongolia for well over a decade now and the company has several advanced exploration projects in the highly mineralized and vastly underexplored South Gobi region of Mongolia. Um, as you can see we've been advancing our Hamaktai project over the last couple of years and 
last year um, we're part way through the exploration drilling but been able to put together um, close to three million tonnes of copper, four million ounces of gold. So it's quite a substantial resource and we hope to be showing that this is a genuine tier one asset in the next couple of years. Um, I think going back to your question, as an explorer or part of the mining industry, I think we may not know it, but we are quite adapt or quite prepared for this type of situation. Um, if you look at a lot of exploration companies, we, we work remotely anyway. We have established infrastructure and communications in place that deal with this remote work. And if I look at um, Xanadu as a case example, this morning I'm talking to and on a daily basis to our geologists that are in the field in the South Gobi. Um, it hasn't changed a lot on a typical day for the exploration. Sure, it's restricted international travel um, and the promotion of the company and the travel for executives. But I think on the ground, um, if you're lucky enough to be in a place which isn't affected by this pandemic, um, it's, a, it's a typical day. But one thing that I see it's critical is what the travel restrictions have taught us is that it's very important you build capacity um, in your field operators. Um, they are the personnel now at the coalface um, and now um, we have international travel restrictions. We're very reliant, particularly companies working internationally on your national teams to make sure drill holes go in the right places, rock samples get taken um, and the work gets done. So that hard work that often gets done in the background um, now you can relax a little bit, you know that the work's being done properly on the ground. Um, so that was critical. And for um, us as a team in Xanadu, um, and me particularly, I was working in um, North East Asia um, during the SARS outbreak that disrupted Asia um, a little while back. And that really taught us how to operate in the field, communications, um, senior staff from around the world. Um, and I think it's just, um, you can keep your work going. The, the worry is obviously the, the effect on the, the capital markets and your ability to raise money. So you've got to be very conscious of that and you can't run out of money. Um, but they're, they're, the, um, they're the underlying conditions we dealt with. And it's um, just another example, I think, of our industry is um, quite well advanced for this type of um, setback. Okay, thank you very much for that, Andrew. Uh, perhaps we can have the results of the first poll up on the screen now. Um, okay, it seems to me that the um, slight majority of voters, 44% of you are quite optimistic about the mining sector over the next 12 months. So perhaps with that, we can just go on to the second question, to the second question I wanted to ask you, which is about managing people. So um, Andrew, perhaps I can ask, ask the first question to yourself. How are you taking care of your staff? Well, we're quite fortunate. We operate in Mongolia, which is the most sparsely populated country in the world. So <laughs> social distancing is quite easy for us in a country like Mongolia. But more seriously, um, countries around the world seem to be at different stages with the COVID pandemic. Um, and we had a little bit of a head start. We had to um, restrict exploration works in early January. Um, and we were operating um, during that period. Um, and Mongolia has had experience, as I said, we could revert back to a SARS um, pandemic we had in Asia um, a decade ago. Um, and the country acted very quickly by restricting international travel. So it's really done uh, a good job, which has helped us with our operations on the ground. You know, we've only had half a dozen cases in Mongolia. So for us, working in the South Gobi um, hasn't really limited our work um, on the ground. Um, but you know, the priority is to protect the health and safety of all our people and contractors and the communities we work in. So we've ensured that the operationally and financially, the integrity of our business is in place. Um, we've also been very proactive in responding to the evolving crisis and implementing several um, a host of controls and procedures um, that are designed to prevent the virus from site. So much of our site visits, we're looking at bringing people in and out of site um, but they're, you know, being tested for temperature, et cetera, before they go to site. And um, when they're on site, they're in a remote location. So um, I think it's just about adapting to um, the environment you have. And it's, it's clear that what was working in one place is that country is in a very different situation to another. So, um, you know, we have to cover all across different zones, but we have to adapt to that. And uh, Anthony, obviously remote working has become more important. What do you think would be the long-term impact COVID-19 and remote working and automation? Look, I mean, I, I, I think 
I think that there will be structural changes to the economy as a result of, of, of what's happened. So I think that there will be you know, more of a focus on on, on people you know, working from from home so that you don't have the burden of, you know, of office accommodation um, you know, hitting, hitting the overhead line and, and those types of things. So I do, I do think that we will see some really interesting structural changes to the economy that result from this. I'm not convinced that we're going to be getting employment, you know, down below double, double digits any, any time soon as a result of some of those, those changes. But, you know, I sort of take on board you know, Andrew's comments and your comments earlier. I think that mining's particularly well placed because of how important it is to global GDP. So I do think that there's going to be you know, a lot of initiatives that result from what's happening at present to, you know, to stimulate, you know, the mining industry, given the, you know, the trickle down effect or the multiplier effect that you know, mining jobs create, you know, globally. But I do think that you know, there will be structural changes to the way that we work that you know, result from you know, effectively what's happened. I think people are going to be less likely to hop on planes. I think that people are, you know, are going to be less likely to, you know, to have you know, expensive office accommodation that, you know, that, that probably proved through this process is, is you know, somewhat unnecessary. And um, question, sorry, I also meant to ask you as well. What have been the most common questions that staff have asked you uh, read COVID-19? I mean, I think that, that our staff are probably no different to everybody else's staff, which is, you know, are we going to be employed tomorrow? You know, I think that this is an issue, especially you know, in the United States where most of our staff are and, you know, in California where, you know, you're seeing food queues for, you know, people queuing that, you know, three weeks ago had, had, had jobs. So, you know, we've got, you know, a staff that are in the high desert of California that are worried about, you know, whether they're going to, be able to pay a mortgage, you know, next month. It's the, you know, it's the nature of, of, of the way that a lot of people, you know, exist. So, you know, for us, it's been more, you know, demonstrating to them that we do have the, you know, the cash at bank. You know, we've, you know, availed ourselves of the you know, US government's, um, you know, loan guarantee schemes that effectively enable us to, you know, to, to pay, you know, staff and to keep staff on. But, I think everybody is you know, particularly concerned about, you know, does the business have enough money? Can, you know, can we continue to expect to, you know, to be paid and what type of sacrifices may, may, or, may, may or may not be necessary, you know, as we continue into this, uh, you know, pandemic? Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, Vincent, what personal protection equipment have you been providing staff? Oh, we're in we're in the interesting situation at the moment where we, we were lucky enough not to have people in the field at the time. We're, obviously fairly deep in, in our in our DFS work and we do we do have two remote operations. One we've finished work here on a lab with a with a laboratory. So we are still dealing with laboratories here and we've got some test work going on in the US, um, which has been interesting for us because they they've been doing some key work on our roasting work in Pennsylvania. And um, so that affected us. We had a consultant over there at the time. She nearly got caught over there so we had to get her out quite quickly to move back. Um, but that I think one of the impacts of that, so we've been lucky enough just to answer your question first off, is that we've been lucky enough to have an office based team of our entire team. So the first thing we can do was to make sure that they're okay and uh, that we could actually separate them. Luckily for us being a small team and a professional team, we set up our IT early on in the process and then got everyone home. Uh, and then this made sure that we were communicating and working at home with, with key objectives. So keeping our distance from each other was the key way of getting things done. Um, but in terms of our contractor, in particular in the US, uh, this has been one that's affected us because we've had material over there being worked on, but the US uh, laboratory um, had to start changing its way, to, its way of working and sh shut down and went to, to ship change. And um, so it, it slowed us down a bit on that side. But again, you know, the, the US is having its own, uh, you're working with your subcontractors and their cultures, and it really pays at this time to be working with good people on the other side. I think if you're, if you, you now realize when you're working with tier one companies on, on your consulting side and on your partner side, this is when it comes good. If you, if you're not doing that, you, you start to pay the price at a time like this, having good uh, corporate oas and management means you feel comfortable with what's going on with your data, your material, with the people handling your material, that they're safe as well you become like an extended family in this situation and I'm sure Anthony knows what I mean when you're running through a process like this and you've got to think of the extended uh, the extended team that you now that, that now belong to you. 
And uh, Vincent, how, how are you staying connected with your employees? Yeah, well, this is, this is an interesting one for us. We've been, we were given good advice and we, we took it and acted quickly in addition to the steps we took when, as soon as we moved the office uh, home, uh, we made sure our IT was in place. We'd already been using Microsoft Teams quite extensively for, um, for document management throughout the last 12 months. So it wasn't difficult for us to start using the application, the team application for communication on a face-to-face -face basis. And I think one of the things we've done uh, quite actively was to make sure we keep face-to-face -face meetings on a daily basis with the team. So every day we meet, the entire team meets 10 o'clock in the morning on a face-to-face -face call on Teams and we work our way around. We've got a chat line going, it's constant and communicative. Um, you know, it's good to have that banter, that banter that you have in the office. It's really important part of, of our work culture at work. And so it, it's been quite hard to, to get everyone over that first stage, but I think um, as the time goes on, it actually gets a lot better. And that all in this together feeling is actually increasing as time passes. Um, not quite the bunker mentality. It's more like, you know, we're gonna work our way through this and get out the other end. Um, in those meetings, we make sure we communicate uh, with each other at the meeting that we want to catch up with another group or another small group on a particular issue and then we'll get off the get off the phone and some time during the day have twos and threes also but just keeping clear focus keep keeping an objective uh, list of things that we're trying to achieve so each individual person when they get off their call they wake up in the morning they know what they're doing they're trying to get it done and that is in line with the company's objective to keep moving the project forward and um, and and, and get rid of those office distractions. So I think in that respect as well, lastly, communicating with everybody, I think that you probably end up having a team meeting in the office, uh, bizarrely, late after this is finished. I think it's changed the way we work forever, uh, to Anthony's point. I think you, you're no longer going to be doing things the way you did them before because you've actually found a slightly better way for people to be effective. But I think the communication levels uh, are fraught in this, in this day, but I think if you put things together uh, and you keep them going and keep the contact there, you, you're not gonna lose, lose anybody along the way. And that's the risk that you, that you develop passengers and, and uh, that's not what you want. But I think we've, at ABL, we've certainly managed to get around that really well. You're working very nicely in this environment. Um, uh, Andrew, uh, how will COVID-19 change the mindset of travel for the mining industry? Um, yeah, look, I, I think it will. Um, if you look at it at the moment, um, I think there's no replacement for face-to-face -face meetings. And um, I think there's no replacement for geologists standing on rocks also. So travel is an essential part of our job and particularly for companies working overseas. Um, but I believe if you look at it in terms of international travel, it's clearly um, going to be different moving forward. And what that means, does it mean less travel um, but does that mean to extended periods away? Um, I'm not quite sure yet, but um, clearly one of the things is that we look at, maybe we did take travel um, a little bit for granted and we need to treat it a little bit more preciously now in terms of it should translate to reduce travel costs for all companies, I think across the board. But um, I think the interesting thing will be how it translates to fly and fly at rosters, um, especially for overseas operations. Um, but I think you're just going to see that people are going to have to travel less um, because, you know, this pandemic is uh, maybe it's a bit of a dress rehearsal for the future, but um, these things aren't going to go away and we have to adapt to them in the future. So um, I think this is, um, this is a bit of a learning curve. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to bring in uh, Mike Hill from Minds and Money. Um, Mike, I believe you had something to say on how uh, travel might, might impact the events business. Well, yeah, thanks, Andrew. I, I mean, I think it already has, really. Um, you know, we've, if you look around the world at what um, people are doing at the moment, events companies who are quickly transitioning to be media companies. I mean, the Denver event is going on today in, in Zurich as a digital event. Um, the well-respected Cambridge House uh, group in, in Canada um, are doing some quite interesting interviews with keynotes and trying to, trying to publish media that way. Uh, we, we certainly um, have adapted with our, our Minds and Money uh, 5 at 5, which has become very popular in a short period of time, uh, which is now running for its fourth session this week. Um, 
And then we've got two virtual events in June. So we're, we're very cognizant of the fact that um, the market is changing. And I think what's interesting, we've talked a bit about uh, share, you know, how we communicate internally to staff, how you communicate with contractors, particularly when you've got uh, remote sites or sites that are internationally. I mean, what I would be interested in finding out is, you know, how do you communicate with your existing shareholders, probably as much as your, you know, new investors at this point, how, you know, what are, what are we finding um, individually? Um, you know, what are the quality of the meetings? How easy is it? How important is it to connect with his existing shareholders? So perhaps if I can answer uh, Vince um, uh, that, to start off, that'd be great. Yeah, look, I think um, the communications are really about those questions, those key questions. What are people asking us and how do we give that information to them? Um, and and in, in the beginning of this, I think really as the lockdown became clear for people, in Australia in particular, where most of our shareholders are, was then about they wanted to have the answers to their key questions. And I think that um, that was about, will you survive this? Have you got a plan to survive this? Uh, will our money be safe with your company? And that's really one of the first questions people want to answer. They also want to know um, that you can confidently say that and that you can actually, that what are you going to do to continue advancing the project despite the conditions around you? Because ultimately, that's what people want to know. They want to know that, are you going to survive? Once you've answered that question, are you going to be there? And will you will you have advanced the project along the way? Um, uh, in terms of ongoing communication, so uh, I mentioned earlier communicating with the board and with your team. Um, the way we've approached it, we've had a very strong internal social media driven strategy for for some time now. So we we add, we we have a channels that we follow through ABL on the Vanadium promotion side, and then on the on the vSUN for the Vanadium battery side. Um, we strongly promote those channels from internal, internally driven resources. Um, so what we've, been, what we've done now is just make sure that that is continued, continuing and continuous. Obviously, when events happen um, in the marketplace or in our project, we'll communicate those across um, in a very timely way, as we would, as we should. Um, but then people know you're still alive, you're doing the things you should be doing. Um, interestingly, on the social media comms, um, increased use of different material types, uh, of different media types, uh, coming up with new ideas, and and making uh, actually ramping up uh, non-COVID related communication because investors have got a lot more screen time than they had. Uh, they a lot of them are sitting at home, uh, looking for things for the next thing, the next big thing, where they want to be, having the time to evaluate companies. So. They're looking at the website, they're looking at your social media content. And um, so actually ramping up in those areas where people can take advantage of new information and keep it going. And that doesn't necessarily reflect just the company. As we all know, we're in commodity space, so people need to be fed information about the commodity you're in, the market you're in, how that market is, uh, is going, what it's gonna look like in the future, because all bets are off and now there's a new set of market rules. So we've just been ramping that on on top of what we already do. Uh, but it is about keeping a presence all the time here and showing that you, you're alive and well and you have an objective. Uh, Anthony, thanks for that, Vince. Um, just on that, I know you mentioned at the start that you've, you've been in the, the positive position of actually raising some money. And I, I see the ASX have um, released a few back-to-back -back trading halts have been relaxed and there's a few other um, placement capacities being increased. With your recent raise, have you found the same sort of thing as Vince is saying? It's important to be in contact with these new or existing shareholders. And again, has is, is it been similar? Your quality of, of, of meetings has been pretty high. Yeah, look, I mean, I, we, we've, we've all, I think, focused on, 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 you know, making the phone calls when we do put out, you know, positive news items. So... You know, it's not just about the face-to-face -face meeting, but it's also about making sure that you know that we're on the phone. You know, and that's something—not something that's just recently happened. It's something that's been a you know very much a focus. Um, you know, the people that are supporting the stock for the last you know three years are the ones that you've got to you know talk to and make sure that you continue to have that that dialogue. Um, you know, the, it it you know talking about you know conferences going virtual. You know, our CEO in California is actually in a conference at present in. Um, Las Vegas for uh, you know, micro caps over in the United States. So, you know, I think that that's you know a positive, and you, know, you probably you probably do get a better quality of um, 
of 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 meeting on the basis that you know people aren't trying to pad meetings out when you you know you fly to New York or Hong Kong or Perth or whatever it is where you know people feel that they've got to do you know, eight meetings a day and you know four of those meetings are good and four are just you know essentially people doing you know doing, yeah. doing favors. Yeah. Um, but you know just more broadly for us, you know the communication strategy has been you know to keep it factual but also to keep it relevant. You know, I mentioned earlier that. You know, there's a lot you can garner from you know, media sources with respect to what's going on with COVID-19 and there's lots of you know, major miners that are talking about COVID-19. So we don't need to come out and rehash you know, the things that they're saying. What we do need to do is to ensure that we're keeping you know, our communications relevant. So what I mean by that is you know, what are we doing as an organisation? Well, we're continuing to progress our project. Uh, you know, we've changed some you know, procurement strategies so that it's back-ended rather than front-ended. You know, we have a final permit that we're in the process of obtaining and we've told people that the, you know, the referral authority is continuing to work, but they're working from home. So, you know, it's factual and it's relevant and it's continuing to keep, you know, shareholders and stakeholders informed as we, you know, traverse, you know, this sort of pre-construction phase that we're working through at present. That makes that make sense. Thanks, thanks Anthony. Um, Funny enough, actually, Andy, um, the last time I saw you was was at PDAC, the the sort of godfather of, of, of all mining events. So, I mean, I think that would be a particularly hard event to do uh, virtually, not speaking for them, but it would be. Um, uh, but we've certainly found, um, as you mentioned, Anthony, that um, there's an appetite for meetings in this virtual space. And there has to be because there's, a, there's an absolute necessity for people to communicate with people around the world, um, existing people and new people. So I think we're, we're as an events company, excited and um you know to be launching some of these events in june so i think the only other part um andrew i'll hand back to you and uh, in this session is just to mention if you do have any questions please uh, let us know there is a chat function in this as well so please feel free to to um to ask us a few questions so andrew i'll hand back to you now thank, thank you. you very much for that mike and uh talking of uh, questions Submitted through the Q and A uh, function, we've had um, a couple of questions sent through there and also sent through earlier. So, just uh, one question that's been um, sent through is: What do you see as being the greatest risk to your respective business plans now, and how are you mitigating against this? That's a question for all three of you. I don't know who would like to answer that first. Uh, maybe I can go to Vincent first. Um, yeah, sure. I think. I think the greatest risk is the length of this um, of this period. I think uh, that's been always been the risk. The biggest risk here is uh, the intensity is clear across many countries and it's varied in different countries. But I think the length that we have to endure this is is, is the unknown, the great unknown here. Because if you shorten it, you get a GFC. If you lengthen it, um, you don't know what you get. And I think um, that unknown length is the biggest risk for us. And I, I, I see that as being because it, it holds you back. You have to preserve your cash to, to keep alive. And if you don't know how long you need to keep it for, then you have to change the whole way you're doing things. So um, the shorter the cycle becomes, as soon as we get certainty on, on the length of the, of the period that which we, we have to operate, uh, the length at which the capital markets are either closed or confused or not, not playing ball, uh, that is the big issue and how it affects our, our product market you know, and, and, the, and, the, and the capital markets. I think so. As soon as we have, as soon as we start to develop clarity, which we are in certain environments, not all of them. Uh, I think you said it before, Andy. It's a different world for different sectors, different countries. Everyone's got a different way of getting out of this and a time frame. So as soon as we know that, uh, we'll start to it'll be, things will be a lot better for us all. And uh, for yourself, uh, Anthony. <laughs> I think that the, I think the real challenge is, is preserving shareholder value, you know, and picking up on, on Vincent's comment there, you know, th does this thing go on? Is it a short, medium or longer term you know, issue? And how do you preserve capital? You know, the last thing you want to be doing is raising money you know, with a depressed share price that perhaps reflects you know, the broader market as opposed to you know, the stock specific you know, fundamentals that you have. So, for, for me, it, it's about you know, preserving shareholder value, which ultimately is reflecting, or well, one, ensuring that, you know, that the safety and everything else of your people is paramount, but two, working out how you continue to you know, add value to your share price so that you don't have to raise money at a, you know, at a much lower level, which ultimately dilutes and, you know, and essentially 
you know, decimate shareholder value. So, you know, that's, you know, that's, I think, the broader, the broader theme. And, you know, is it short, is it long, is it medium term, or what does it look like? But ultimately, it's, you know, how do we protect or preserve shareholder value during, you know, during the, this period? And uh, yourself, uh, Andrew? Again, it's the unknown length of it is the key thing. We, um, as exploration companies, we spend money and you, um, you've always got to raise money. But, you know, it's, it's, if you spend that money on drilling, how are you going to get the upside from the results? How are you going to be able to raise money at a higher price in the future? Um, the unknowns are the difficult things. And I think, um, too, it's the unknowns are related to external factors which are out of our control. It's um, demand for metal prices. It's um, the general equity capital markets the condition they're going to be in 12 months time um, and you know ultimately we're here to preserve the value in the company um, and you know get returns for shareholders but it's the little unknowns in the short term that are hard to manage um, you know you always have a mix of you know be proactive get out there start drilling that obviously costs money um, hibernation you know that's uh, another way so the strategies can be quite different and um, but you don't know how long um, you're going to have to adapt to the the new environment. That's that's the that's the critical challenge in the short term. Thank you very much for that. So uh, perhaps we can bring our second polling question up onto the screen now, which is about remote and virtual working. So the polling question just coming up on your screen is: How much more remote virtual working do you expect to do over the next 12 months? With new number five options: 70% more, 50% more, 30% more. 10% more or back to normal for uh, from June onwards. Whilst you're all like voting on that, I'm just going to uh, go into like um, a few sort of like questions. And I probably wanted to maybe go to some sort of like positive news stories. I think the reason why I wanted to go to positive news stories is back to I think the opening poll where I think 44% of you said you're quite optimistic about the mining uh, industry. And I think it's very important that we can cover off some of these positive news uh, uh, stories that are actually coming out of it. Um, maybe as an opening question to yourself, Andrew, um, I, I saw on the news that you're partnering with Jogmec on your Red Mountain project. Can you just could you give us a bit of an update on that? Yeah, no, it's... Um... We're very pleased um, to have signed a joint venture arrangement with Jogmeg. Um, we're a small company with um, several advanced copper and gold projects in the South Gobi. Um, while we progress our flagship project to Mugtai, um, we've been able to um, uh, bring Jogmeg in to uh, help with exploration in our Red Mountain project. It's a very early stage copper and gold project. Um, and you know that 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 agreement should advance the project as a project that we've um, haven't spent too much money on or doing too much drilling in the, the past couple of years. It's got some fantastic drill intercepts, there's several intervals there of 200 meters that have one percent copper from surface. Um, but that opportunity now is really to open it up. We're really looking at some advanced um, exploration in terms of some 3D geophysics here. Um, it's a very early stage project, so an exciting start and um, a fantastic opportunity to. Uh, work with Jogmeg, um, who's the, with the Japanese government. Mm -hmm. And um, Anthony, I, I see that your fork, KD Borat Mines, announced an increase in SOP production. Can you sort of um, sort of like expand a little bit upon that and what that means for your business? Yeah, look, the context is that here is the the third largest agricultural commodity uh, can, the country. If it was a country on it by, by itself, so it's a mass agricultural producer. We position ourselves as a specialty fertiliser company. Um, borates, 20% of the borate market goes into um, the fertiliser market as a micronutrient. Um, potassium sulphate or SOP is a 7 million tonne a year market with the US net importer of, um, of SOP. Um, we have a borate project that has an SOP byproduct. The borate project um, ultimately delivers about 410,000 tonnes a year of boric acid. Um, we increased recently in our enhanced definitive feasibility study. We changed the flow sheet slightly, and what that did is it gave us three times the production of potassium sulfate or SOP as a result of um, the flow sheet changes. So we're now looking at 360,000 tonnes a year of SOP. Um, you know, interestingly, we're either an SOP producer or a boric acid producer. We have a negative cost on either. So if you call us a boric acid producer, we produce boric acid at negative $20 a tonne with the byproduct credit. Or if you call us an SOP producer, we produce SOP at negative $120 a tonne with the boric acid credit. 
um, you know, so really exciting to you know, change the, I guess, the, the, the increase, the SOP production, you know, sitting in you know, the world's largest agricultural market um, with the project in, in California. But, you know, more broadly, we've now seriously attached ourselves to the food security thematic, um, you know, and whether we like it or not, this population is, is increasing. People are going to need to continue to, to eat. And you know the whole you know, specialty fertilizer, fertilizer places. You know, is is it's pretty exciting when you look that you know, um, you know there's not a lot of uh, emerging borate projects, nor are there a lot of emerging SOP projects. And you know, China's having some issues with SOP production at present with their Qinghai Salts projects. Um, you know, so we think that we're really, really well positioned in the in the market, and we were pretty excited with the results of the enhanced definitive feasibility study that was released last Thursday. And uh... Thank you very much, sir. And uh, Vincent, post-COVID-19, do you think that this will be a watershed year for Vanadium Redox? Um, yeah, Andrew, I think the year is a bit shorter than, than we'd like to, to be. It's going to end up being a six-month period, but we'll call it the six months of, 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 of Vanadium Redox. Um, for those people lis listening um, and watching in, Vanadium Redox flow batteries are a type of um, energy storage device that uses Vanadium in solution as an electrolyte. and uh, ideally suited for long duration uh, uh, renewable energy storage. Um, and they're, they're, they were in Australia the invention, but they are available commercially from a number of producers around the world. Um, what we think uh, and what we're actively promoting, and, th and we're not alone in this, uh, Bushveld Minerals and Bushveld Energy in, in the UK uh, have recently done quite a significant deal with two battery uh, manufacturers, one in, uh, one in Austria, one in the UK and the US. Uh, what we what we believe about this is that its time will come um, in the aftershot of this environment um, because remember when we went into this uh, climate change was on everyone's lips we had the we had the fire situation in, in Australia people were very much focused on climate change and I think that that hasn't gone away I think and Andrew one of your questions that you got earlier was about it reduced the impact of release reduced pollution on future views so remember that people are out there are still thinking that we need to get back to where we were. And that offers a lot of opportunity, not only in EVs, but also in the capturing of renewable energy. So um, selfishly, as AVL, uh, as a future vanadium producer, we absolutely see the growth in the vanadium market coming from um, energy storage applications of vanadium because they can grow the market significantly above its current size and also diversify it. So, we're very interested in, in being part of that. We're actively merging into it. We're getting involved with the producers um, at, a, at an industry level as well as a company level. So yeah, I'd like to think it would be this year, but it may be uh, the next 12 months after June, you might call it that. But we're very pro and, and, and very much uh, involved. And we, we think a lot of investors are very interested in that too, um, despite uh, the current situation. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of questions that have come through on the chat function. Um, uh, question to any of the panelists: uh, What are your perceptions of international commitment to you as as Australian companies? Is there a feeling that they are turning more internally to their country interests? Look, I'll, I'll take off. Ask, uh, the, um, you know, we've got you know flagship is in is in California and and. I think that there's not a lot of risk around nationalization of projects in in the united states but i think the reality is is that the world will progressively or quite quickly change from how do we keep jobs to how do we find new jobs you know and where the three of us are in the position of essentially being able to start building mines that one employ you know, lots of people in the construction phase but then two employ lots of people on an ongoing basis that you know in turn has a massive multiplier effect because of the upstream nature of the mines so you know, we're certainly you know, not finding any issues in, in California, not, but you know, our team is based in California and we employ only Americans, so I suspect we're not you know, um, perceived as an Australian company over there in event. Okay. Do any of the other panelists have any uh, comments to add to that? Andrew, I'll, I'll go, Andrew. Um, the, yeah, with, with respect to that job creation opportunity, uh, being in, in vanadium in our particular case, uh, which falls 
very squarely in the list of critical minerals. Uh, the, the relationships, the old relationships that exist in the world with respect to critical minerals, looks like it will take a, an interesting turn. Uh, and it's already taking an interesting turn where companies are looking to secure critical minerals for their own uh, down, you know, up, downstream applications, um, whether it be steel making or uh, other, other applications. So uh, in, a, in a vanadium sense, and probably that's true of other, other battery and critical steel metals, uh, we think there's going to be an alignment of, 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 of countries with each other to ensure where their capacity has dropped off, it can be increased and they might source those raw materials where they don't have them from countries where they can reliably get them. And I think as a tier one country, uh, any tier one country that can produce that material is gonna be looking, uh, be in a very favorable position to, to work with its allies in that respect. Sure. And um, I guess it's just the same question for yourself, Anthony, but I think also bringing in a, you know, a news story about sort of like uh, potential users of sort of like a proper, I think that Robert Friedland um, has been saying at frequently his presentations for the last sort of 10 years or so about how kind of, kind of COVID can kind of like help build germs. I'm just wondering in a post COVID-19 sort of climate, you might see more interest for like kind of copper, whether it's either due to sort of like, kind of like health sort of like reasons. Yeah, I, um, I caught Robert's talk at PDAC, Revenge of the Miners, but um, yeah, that's correct. We used to use copper um, for all medical supplies and, um, and operating beds. And we used to use copper because it um, is resistant to a lot of bacteria and a lot of um, germs. So um, yeah, stainless steel just doesn't have that capability. So I think that, you know, for a lot of these super bugs, not only COVID, but a lot of super bugs we see um, in hospitals now, the way forward is to use copper. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll see that implemented soon. Okay. And um, with that, thank you very much. I mean, perhaps we can have the uh, second polling screen. Uh, we have the results of the second poll up on the screen now. So you voted. So it looks to be pretty evenly balanced, but uh, certainly very, very few of you suspect things to return back to normal from June onwards. Most of you certainly expect to be doing 30 to 70% more remote virtual working over the uh, next 12 months. So I think that we, with that, we are, I think, uh, out of time. So many thanks to Anthony, Andrew and Vincent. Thank you to all of our listeners for dialing in. As I mentioned at the start, all residents will be sent to recording this webinar afterwards. Um, please don't forget our upcoming events that uh, Mike Hill mentioned earlier. We have our Minds and Money APAC Connect on the 23rd to 25th of June and our Minds and Money EMA Connect on the 16th to the 18th of June. And we also regularly have our private fives running at 5 p.m. every week. Um, pieces of all these events will be you know, will be uh, sent to you afterwards, and you can also find them online at our website. And for more great news and content, please check out our Mining Beacon website at miningbeacon.com. Many thanks, and see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.